Okay, so j just a quick note about like what we're trying to do here is, uh, well, the title of the panel is The Future of Scala. So what we're hoping to do is to have kind of an open discussion or an open stage anyway, where um, you get to ask questions that are important to you about where Scala is headed, uh, certain aspects of Scala, the community, what not. And uh, we have you know people from very differing backgrounds here that can um, try and give you an answer, try to have the, uh, an intelligent debate about this. And uh, you know, Hopefully your questions will be less, how do I, and more like, where do you see this and that going, or uh, how do you perceive uh, Scala will look in a couple of years, that sort of thing. So if anyone has, an, has a question to kick this off, that would be a good time. So, Mail. My question is, uh, how do you think uh, Java 8 is going to affect Scala? Uh, both technically and and adoption wise considering lambda expressions in uh, in java both technically how it would affect scala and how the alternative it would affect i want to hear eugene <laughs> okay so any takers he wants to hear eugene he wants to hear eugene eugene wants to hear you so <laughs> i think i'll start According to my well limited knowledge of uh, what what's been baked uh, by our type safe team, so maybe uh, if if you've been following, uh, there have been some progress on the SAM front. So SAM is uh, an acronym acronym for uh, single abstract method. Uh, something that's uh, some notion that's been introduced in uh, uh, Java 8 to support lambdas. And uh, well, as I said, we've made some progress and uh, it's even in 2.11 M4, uh, this progress, uh, that will ultimately allow us to support uh, lambdas in Java. So this answers at least the part of the question of how we're going to, to live with Java 8. And uh, well, speaking of what we can make of it, uh, how will lambdas affect us? Well, maybe Stefan knows more, ha ha ha. <laughs> Thanks for the segue, Eugene. So um, I think uh, Java 8 will actually be good for us and for Scala. Because um, on one hand, Scala, Java is catching up. They're gaining one feature that uh, was available in Scala for a long time, but it's only a very small feature. It's just the lambdas and some simplifications to uh, to type inference, but uh, Scala still has a lot more to offer on top of that. But uh, by getting this feature into Java, it means many more developers will expect that feature and will know how to work with it. And this can only be good for Scala. Also, the Java libraries will adopt to it. So there will be less friction when you want to call into a Java library from Scala because it will, you will get the SAM types and it will just work from Scala just as effortlessly as it will then in Java 8 work from Java. So overall, I think uh, it's very positive. Also, they need to optimize the JVM for that. It was not tuned at all for this usage scenario and this might uh, improve the performance of Scala as well. So I, I just have a, a really small thing to add that uh, maybe you've heard of our new backend that's been brewing after 2.11 uh, and for 2.11. It, uh, people have been experimenting specifically with uh, making use of uh, the new JVM machinery to support lambdas uh, for for our profit to to make our lambdas faster and probably uh, to to emit less bytecode that's necessary to support lambdas. So that's even better for us. So most of what I wanted to say was already said by Stefan and Eugene. I'd like to add a uh, few more things. One that is hopefully um, the ability to have a better stack trace in Java, in Scala code uh, that translates to JVM would um, be improved by uh, Java 8's uh, lambdas because they will have to deal with the same problems that Scala deals with. So that's uh, one take on it. And another thing is that um, I think it's it's going to improve adoption of Scala, uh, paradoxically maybe, because it's going to give people a 
taste of what they can achieve with functional programming, but it's not going to be enough. It's going to give, it's going to um, move more people towards functional programming and then they're going to realize what they are missing like in, in a real uh, functional programming language which will then segue them into Scala in my opinion. Just to add a, a characteristically confrontational point of view to the argument is that um, I often get asked that question and a lot of time the subtext, the subtext of the question is why should I invest in Scala when JDK 8 or Java 8 is right, right around the corner? So I have two things to add here. First of all, uh, if Java 8 is out within the year, I'll be seriously surprised. And if your operations team is going to install JDK 8 on your servers for you to use within the next three years, I'm going to be surprised. And the second part of the answer is that um, Lambdas are a big deal. Lambdas are one of the things are, well, closures, whatever, are, are one of the features that have been sorely missing in Java ever since moving from C Sharp to Java. And that was, I think, six years ago, give or take. So that's a huge gap to cover. And I'm glad that they're finally doing something about it. The JVM improvements are good for everyone. But the bottom line is, I don't think it'll have any effect on Scala adoption because it covers one major gap that's been there for ages, and it still misses out on a whole slew of features that Scala has and Java 8 does not, that I find are uh, exceedingly useful. I know that some of these are, are actually a little inaccurate. Like my knowledge of Java 8 is a bit out of date, but in Scala you have you know, everything from traits to a really, really powerful type system, and Java 8 is just not going to give you those features. So it's going to be too little, way too late, and, you know, it's not going to matter any for actual Scala adoption, in my opinion. Just one more. So, um, hope that answered the question. One more. Hi, uh, I have a question about the uh, Play framework. Uh, how do you see uh, the, the, the future direction of uh, Play and Scala uh, as compared to other rapid, rapid application uh, frameworks like uh, Ruby and Grails, etc.? Like, if someone were to choose uh, an environment today, uh, why should he choose Scala over some of the alternatives? Any takers? Okay, so seeing as we don't appear to have any web developers in the, in the, um, <laughs> on either side of the table and I have a, a bit of experience with that, I can tell you that in my opinion, and it's a very limited value considering the fact that I'm not a, a huge web developer either, is that the reason you would, you, you would choose Play over Rails is the same reason you would consider Scala over Ruby, which is, you know, one option is you prefer statically typed languages. That's like the number one reason for it. Um, you need something within the ecosystem, like you need Apache Lucene or you need uh, you need to integrate better with Hadoop or, or, or anything from the Java ecosystem. That's certainly possible, but harder to do uh, from a Ruby app. Or third, you do something where the sort of performance gains you get by running on the JVM versus running on the, on the well, RVM, such as the case may be, um, are worthwhile. Can I give specific examples? Not really, but, you know. There, there's, pardon? Twitter, uh, Twitter is one example, but Twitter uh, is arguably much more of a backend than a web app. So I guess, <laughs> I guess it, it all depends on what exactly you're trying to achieve. Like if, if you have a very simple, um, well, not even very, but if you have a relatively simple website, relatively simple requirements as far as performance and scale are concerned in the back end, then it's a matter of preference. And if you have those, then it's a matter of what you're most comfortable with, because let's face it, amazing and scalable systems have been written in Ruby and Python and PHP. Um, I, I wouldn't choose any of those to build and run those systems, but it's a matter of what you're comfortable with. For a layman who's not really experienced with building uh, large-scale systems in any of these environments, 
I'm not sure I'd have a recommendation because there's going to be challenges in either. So I hope that's like the best answer I can give. Okay. Um, oh. <laughs> okay, we, we uh, I can't say we're building web applications because we're not a web site or anything like that. But... Um, Aren't you a search engine or something? No, we don't have a search engine, but we do have a... No, we... <laughs> we don't. <laughs> if, if you don't know, when you search at Yahoo, the results come from Bing. Okay? If it's a surprise for you to you, look better. Um, no, we don't have a search engine, but, but we do build web applications. And um, I, I can, I can answer... I, I'm, I'm not sure this is the answer you're looking for, and I'm not going to go into Scala versus Ruby versus PHP. Th that's a religious thing. But for us, um, it was easier moving to Scala as a language than moving to Play or Lyft or whatever uh, framework, because this is something that using Scala as a language is something that is, is quite transparent to the deployment and and these service engineers and stuff like that. So I think that like like Tomer said, you're you're not going to see uh, Java 8 for at least a year after it's out. And you said two years, but I'll give you that. It's you'll ha these frameworks will have to be much much more mature before you see them in production in large. You know, corporate environments. Um, you'll see them, but I, I think you won't see them. Uh, it, uh, well, uh, Foursquare, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But I, I think that in you know corporate America, it will take some time. I'm actually thinking more of a startup there. Than say, I'm. Yeah. I, I. It's more difficult for me to answer about that. So we, we had a question from the middle here last time. So we'll do that and then head over there. Um, so my question is, given that Java is not going away anytime soon, um, as well, Java 8 is coming, and also, um, obviously, we know that COBOL is still around. Um, <laughs> When it, it, should third-party libraries, like someone's writing infrastructure for something new, there's two options. One is to write a Scala library, which is obviously cooler because it's in Scala. Um, another option would be to write a Java library and make it Scala-friendly with some sort of APIs around that are more Scala-oriented. But um, because if you go for the Java option, then maybe then you've got a bigger community base um, and therefore more contributors and everything. But on the other hand, maybe we need to look forward and just press on with Scala in order to increase its adoption. So I just wonder what people think of that. Well, my opinion is uh, if you want to support Java, you can have um, Java adapter rather than the other way around. Use Scala, uh, use all the power of Scala, write your library in Scala, and then backport it to Java via uh, converter APIs. Akka did that, for instance. You can use Akka uh, from Java, but Akka is written in Scala. And Play 2 is written in Scala, but you can also use it from Java. It's just much uglier. So this way you get the best of both worlds. You, you program in Scala and you help uh, promote the Scala community. You help increase adoption of Scala and you, you still give uh, you know, late adopters the ability to use your library without committing to Scala. So I probably stole everybody else's answers, but... <laughs> I actually have an answer which is slightly even snobbish. It's Paul Graham wrote in, I think it was 2003, about hiring Python programmers and Lisp programmers, and not Java programmers, because you want the people which are doing the new, the new stuff, not the bureaucratic stuff. It was true, true in 2003. It's true now. I want contributors. I want the contributors who are tired of Java, who want to look forward. I don't care if they contribute part of the library in Clojure, but I do not want people who still think that Java is the cutting edge in which they want to work and contribute. I would arguably force the libraries to be all Scala, maybe Clojure, maybe not, if something new comes along even that, just to get the people 
who are most interested in moving the, the community, the language forward. And the people who are saying the JVM is nice, let's work with the JVM, but Java, even with Java 8, it's a dead language. It's, it's, it's going to be, in 10 years, going to be the COBOL of uh, our time. Java isn't dead, it's just fun. <laughs> like Zappa, like Java. But I uh, think Zappa is more fun to listen to than Java is to write. Yeah. OK, there, was, there were a couple of questions from this side, I think. Oh, OK. <laughs> Hi. Sorry, um, I'm writing a Scala code in uh, uh, with BDD, and uh, this, yeah, sorry. So uh, this, uh, you know, write code and uh, run your test cycle is uh, very long because of the Scala compiler. Um, so I'm wondering if there is any work being done to optimize the Scala compiler and the SBT and uh, this cycle because it is very very annoying. I'm also writing in other platforms and. You know, doing BDD or TDD is so valuable to have this uh, cycle uh, being very, very fast. <laughs> so, uh, any takers from the panel? I have just one perspective, so we'll start with yours. <laughs> So there is indeed work going on about improving the performance of Scala. This is actually one of the most important topics for Scala 2.11. It just turns out that it is very hard to do in practice. In theory, everyone wants it, including us at TypeSafe, because we're compiling the Scala compiler a lot, and that is a really big piece <laughs> of software. <laughs> So I think the, the best prospect there is to improve incremental compilation. We've seen a couple of issues lately uh, where SPT was actually recompiling too much and we're looking into these and improving this in SPT. So uh, while a fresh compile from scratch won't get faster by that, it will greatly reduce the compilation time in many scenarios where you do things like use the cake pattern and then modify something in there which might trigger a recompilation of uh, source files uh, currently which is not actually needed and when you're using uh, any tool which is based on SPT and that includes uh, Zinc the incremental standalone compiler which as far as I know is also used nowadays by the Scala Maven plugin then you should benefit from this uh, performance improvement there's also some work going on at EPFL uh, on improving the uh, back end and the optimizer and the they shaved a bit of time off, but most of the time is spent in the type checker. And uh, people have been working on that, uh, getting some small improvements. I don't think there's anything uh, huge in this area around the corner because all the low hanging fruit has already been picked. So anything that's left will be hard to improve. I actually have two, th two things to add. The first is uh, on the short term, there's been a number of actually pretty effective tricks that have been done um, throughout the, the ecosystem, throughout the, the Scala tooling ecosystem. And uh, the first is um, the, the continuous compile mode that SBT has and a lot of its derivative tools like the Play Framework uh, console, etc. You can pretty much instruct SBT to, uh, instead of just compiling, running your test, you can add tilde as a, as a prefix and it just runs an incremental uh, incremental continuous compile mode and it's actually really surprisingly fast so as it turns out that at least for moderately sized projects the startup time for compiling uh, especially maven and zinc through the maven plugin the the startup time of bootstrapping the compiler doing all the class path like the class loading that the compiler actually needs to do preloading all the source files that don't need to be recompiled but are already compiled through the incremental compiler that actually accounts for a huge percentage of the time spent on compilation so intellij actually uh, added on its previous major iteration they added in uh, sorry about that an external uh, build mode that actually runs an external process hosting the Scala, uh, the Scala compiler. That's improved things, but it's not, in, in practice, it's 
way better than the previous uh, the previous mode of operation, but it's not nearly as good as what SBT in effect does. Uh, so I guess there is some room to uh, to improve there. And uh, the external tools, Zinc, ha Zinc, which is the, the SBT incremental compiler forked into its own project, also has uh, something called Nailgun integration, which allows you to run your own compile server as an external uh, process, which also helps a lot. So all that happens in the short term. Longer term, uh, my opinion is that, I don't know if any of you remember uh, switching from, for instance, Borland or Whatcom C++ compiler to Visual Studio. And and uh, having something between 10 and 100 times slower compilation times, like you know, where you used to compile your project in about five seconds, now it takes about five minutes. Um, no one remembers that because the hardware got so fast, so fast, so fast, <laughs> okay? It took so little time for the hardware to become so fast that no one noticed it. So. Whereas today uh, on large enough projects, you may feel that Scala compilation is slow and I share your pain because I do too. In my opinion, and for the same size projects, because projects really aren't getting that much bigger. Okay, in two to three years, no one's gonna give a crap. Just a thought. Hmm? Maybe. The type system. Well, speaking of parallelization, I think I can comment a bit. Uh, well, uh, pro probably uh, those of you who tried to use uh, runtime reflection, which is uh, sort of built on the compiler, so runtime reflection uses a subset of the compiler. Uh, well, probably you know that it's not thread safe, and it's not thread safe, uh, which means that you cannot just use runtime reflection in two threads simultaneously. It's because the compiler is not thread safe. So this is a problem, and uh, we're working on it. But uh, immediately, we, we won't be able to, uh, to, to, take, uh, to, to make use of uh, multi-cores. That's the first thing. And the second thing is that, well, type checking, I, I'm not sure how parallelizable it is, because, well, everything essentially might depend on everything. And uh, th therefore, probably, it, it won't be a very good thing to do. But uh, again, uh, th this, this is a subject of research, and maybe something drastic can be done here. Can never be sure. Okay, I think we have a question from the panel for a change. And prior to that, I'm just going to state the obvious and say that if you're not using SSDs uh, on your workstations, you should. It improves Scala compilation time exponentially. You should. You should probably shoot your. Uh Purchase people, finance. You should probably shoot your finance people or purchase people as well while you're at it. <laughs> so I, I have um, a question, and it deals with. Um, it's more of a philosophical question, really. Some of you may know uh, that at the last Scala Days conference, Rod Johnson, who used to be Spring CEO, had a somewhat controversial uh, talk. And the things he talked about were, uh, should Scala slow down? And uh, should Scala developers be more pragmatic? So I'm not gonna talk about being pragmatic because this is like a Pandora's box, but I would like to raise the question, should Scala development slow down? And should Scala development and should Scala uh, runtime and Scala compiler start uh, being backwards compatible? I think I took the mic since I'm coming from I think the biggest company here. Live person has 150 developers right now. Most of them are working in Java, and yes, but I think you're using Scala on your small startup stuff. And Yahoo, I think, is better. It's more modular than Live Person. It's, uh, Live Person has essentially one big product and all the satellite products. And the thing is, we're already feeling the pain of this. Uh, non-backwards compatibility. I just told the uh, Sagiz here, I just told him, yeah, we're still stuck on uh, 2.9 because of some legacy software. And he looked at me like, you're on 2.9, you have to go to 2.10, and 2.11 has these uh, performance improvements. Thing is, the more we want Scala to get adopted, the harder it's gonna be whenever you reach a bigger company, you're never gonna be able to move everybody over at once. 
and we're already feeling this pain. And a new brand, you actually did this, but for much smaller, so. Let's yeah, so story, uh, uh, a couple of comments on that is the first thing is that uh, at New Brand, as you mentioned, uh, which is my previous startup, we actually migrated from Scala 2.9 to Scala 2.10, uh, which is a major Scala version and also a major set of uh, improvements, changes, uh, re-architectures to the compiler and the class library. So it's a fairly big change. It took one senior developer about, uh, I think, four days in total to get the whole thing done, including fix-ups, including helping others uh, within the team sort out all their you know, various small issues with uh, IntelliJ setup and all that. And it's, it's not a humongous project, but I mean, it, it, it's a project that has to this day about 50 uh, kilo lines of code of Java and about 100 kilo lines of code of Scala. So it's what I would consider a good medium-sized project. Um, so I don't see that as a huge problem. I do see um, two things. One is that backwards compatibility has improved dramatically over the last few versions. Like between major versions, it's improved incredibly. Uh, we started off with Scala 2.8 and very shortly migrated to 9, and that was actually quite painful back in the day. That was two years ago or so. Uh, the migration from 2.9 to 2.10 was really, really easy. The migration between minor versions is practically, you know, practically no work at all. Um, so it's not that I don't agree that there's a concern there. I just think it's it's got over time it's got to be small enough that it's that it shouldn't affect anyone to the point where it actually hurts that much, and it can be solved fairly easily and it keeps getting better. So I don't see this as a as a like forward going concern. And I'm going to limit my uh, criticism of Rod Johnson to that, I think, at this point. Anyone else? My question was, my question was should uh, Scala improve on backwards compatibility? I think it should keep going the way it is. That is, maintain binary backwards compatibility between minor versions completely smash binary bin binary compatibility if needed between major versions and keep keep the changes to a, to a sensible minimum uh, because over time we, we actually gradually migrated over time uh, libraries that we use that we depend on from 2.9 to 2.10 and most of them just worked out the box we only needed to migrate one or two to like a 2.10 snapshot before a formal release came out so it wasn't really painful so i think the current direction is a good one and as as much as possible that's what should happen yeah uh, so speaking of backward compatibility i want to tell you a story about some ridiculous thing right so uh when I came to EPFL, they they were developing Scala 2.10. By they, I mean us, EPFL and TypeSafe together, All right? And uh, since we were in uh, milestone process, it, it meant that we can commit any stuff that we want, and well, it will be included in the trunk, no problem. And I so got addicted to it that after Scala 2.10, after code freeze, I tried to to do some small change, you know, just tweak the reflection API, be deprecate one method, introduce another. And then my pull request was rejected. I thought, oh my God, what's going on? And then I got an explanation. In 2.10.x, and uh, I would imagine in other versions as well, in 2.11, uh, we're supposed to be both backward and forward compatible between versions, which means that, uh, well, it's uh, the code written for 2.10.0 should, uh, should work in 0.2, and vice versa. Code written for 0.2 should work for 0.0, right? This is ridiculous. I cannot experiment anymore. So, well, but I, I, I think this uh, this answers the question: Should we improve or not? Well, we we already are improving, and I think it's quite useful because, well, guys, if if we have some fix that's been introduced just in 2.10.2, like implicit macros, hint hint, you can just uh, you can just upgrade your compiler immediately and make use of it. You don't need to, to recompile your libraries or whatever. You can just use it, and there won't be problems because we're compatible. And now Stefan wants to say something as well. 
Okay, so maybe I can add something about the forward compatibility here. This was uh, not really a an intended design decision. It was more of a side effect of the way dependency resolution works in SPT, because you have to encode the Scala version into every artifact you publish, and there were, there was no mechanism in place to give you backward compatibility without also enforcing forward compatibility. There's always a limit to forward compatibility because if you see it in its strictest sense, strictest sense, it means you cannot fix any bugs because somebody might be using that bug as a feature. So the only way to be forward compatible is not to change anything. So realistically speaking, what we want is backward compatibility in one major Scala version and then you'll have breaking binary compatibility changes in the next. But you should be able to improve it within that version and that's what we're aiming for to have uh, for future Scala versions when the tooling support is improved. If I can add a comment about whether uh, we should slow down or speed up, I think it depends on your point of view. Academia pretty much wants to keep the pace because uh, Scala was a research project at EPFL and it still is and these people are working in lots of different directions there and doing lots of exciting stuff. On the other hand, uh, for about two years now, uh, Scala has been a commercial product which is uh, uh, produced by TypeSafe and there's a Scala distribution that is part of the TypeSafe stack and commercial adopters very much want some stability. So we're kind of going in both directions. On the one hand, mainline Scala has stabilized and it will continue to stabilize uh, in the way that we're in the sense that we're more careful what we add there to Scala. But we still have all these exciting projects going on at EPFL which explore different things, but they're not ending up necessarily in mainline Scala. So that's the reason why you see, for example, Eugene's uh, Macro Paradise branch, where all the great new macro features uh, can be tested in a separate Scala release, so to speak. And we also have things like Scala Virtualized, which are not part of mainline Scala. Eventually, some of these uh, features will prove to be useful and, and successful, and then they might end up in a future Scala release. Hold on a sec so we can get it on video. Okay. Everything we use is uh, open source anyway, and since the compatibility in the source level is much, much better than the binary level. So the question is, why not ditch the binary, make it something that is cached on, on the side when I compile? I use sources, I download the whole internet anyway when I start a new project. So I might as well compile it as it go and ditch all the compatibility issue into something that happens in the build machine and on my machine and all the rest is in source level. So the question is, why not move to have package management at the source level and have it one of the core ways we do think. I'm, I'm going to take advantage of the fact that I'm holding the microphone to just say one sentence. Because of Gen 2, moving on, uh, who wants to take this? OK, no, so, so I'll just, yeah? Oh, OK, great. I'm Gen 2 here too. My condolences. <laughs> so uh, what I, I <laughs> I cannot directly answer that question because my knowledge about uh, the current uh, architecture of Ivy and Maven is too limited to, to answer and to know if this would be feasible with these systems or if we'd have to invent a completely different package management system for that. One thing I can tell you is that at TypeSafe we're working on something, on an, a project called dbuild and on a setup called the community build. This dbuild tool helps you to take uh, projects, uh, which are SPT projects, for example, and rewire them to compile against uh, different versions of dependencies. And eventually we want to get to the point where we have a community build in addition to the projects uh, made by TypeSafe, which consists of all the most popular uh, open source Scala libraries. And whenever we we make a change somewhere in Scala or in one of the other projects, uh, then we'd like to build all the community projects and all the types of projects against this very latest version. So while the distribution in the end would still be done by the individual projects and would still be binary, we'd get an immediate feedback on whether anything breaks and we could investigate this much 
faster and ensure that uh, the authors of these projects know about this in time and don't wait until there's a completely new release and then it will take ages to catch up until you get all the projects that you depend on for that release. As you mentioned, everything is everything you use is open source. So why not start an open source project that does exactly what you wanted? That's that's the philosophy, right? Do it. Don't wait for someone else to do it. Do it. The, the major difference between um, Scala and what you describe, especially for Python and Node.js, is that it's way easier to do in Python and Node.js, as they are you know, dynamic languages, they're handled very differently, whereas including the build system for every single dependency, um, you, know, you, you can do one of two things. You can either have a unified build system across your whole dependency stack, which will never happen because people have different preferences and different philosophies, like some use Maven, some use Gradle, some use SBT. You know, you, you can't really force open source projects to a single platform uh, unless you don't need a build platform per se. And, uh, you know, that, that pretty much means that uh, in order to have what you describe, you need to import the build system for every single dependency in your stack. And that's that just never works. Okay, it's been tried before. Uh, and, you know, I, I pointed to Gentoo uh, ironically, and it's only semi-sarcastically. Gentoo is very, very hard to run if you're not an avid open source developer who knows the stack, full, who knows the full stack and knows how to solve problems. And I wouldn't recommend running Gentoo to anyone but the most die-hard Unix Anyone. open source fans, and maybe not even them. So it's exactly the same problem well, with like open source dependency distribution. Yep. Oh, sorry. Figure it out. Well, we don't actually have a lot of time, so you know we'll play it by ear and see if we can have one or two more questions. OK, I will speak first. So I have a question to, to Eugene and Stefan. Um, the question is, uh, as uh, two representatives of uh, EPFL and TypeSafe, the guys who, who bring Scala to us, it's interesting for, for me to hear about uh, what are the most uh, frequent uh, language feature requests and requests in general that you hear from the community. Because this is something that we only get a reflection of through the different uh, uh, forums and uh, the Google groups and uh, so on. So it's interesting to hear what, what you hear from the first source. Okay, so uh, speaking for TypeSafe, and uh, I've, I've heard a lot there from our customers when I'm in contact with them. Uh, I think the three most important features that people want are compiler performance, compiler performance, and compiler performance. And after that, uh, the fourth one is uh, improved tooling. Backwards compatibility uh, is, is all. Yeah. I think so. It also comes up a lot, but it's mainly the compiler performance and uh, the tooling, and we're working actively on uh, both areas. Maybe Eugene wants to add something there? Yeah, that's really very nice. And uh, I mean, speaking of tooling, that's that's probably the uh, the biggest thing that people ask for me when we're talking about macros. All the second one is probably macro annotations, I guess. Yeah, because well, they're they're so natural, and everyone expects to to just have them. <laughs> well, and uh, well, speaking of the rest, um, I, I I think backwards compatibility of traits it immediately comes to to my mind. And and sp speaking of um, well, speaking of the impression that you only get a reflection of stuff that's going on. I think uh, forums represent a huge amount of our communication traffic with uh, with the folks because well we're open source and we discuss stuff uh, open source. So uh, b back then when uh, when I just came to EPFL, we used to have an internal mailing list for for just Lamp, our laboratory, 
and then we sort of ditched it and we, we discuss everything in Scala internals. So if there's some some uh, new development going on, some new language feature, then after brief internal discussions at our meetings uh, that happen every week, we we post this to, to Scala internals. So it's quite representative, I think. Okay, there was, yeah. <laughs> Uh, considering what Stefan said about the um, uh, micro paradise and how Scala like tries to be compatible backward and forward, uh, are there any tendencies for like splitting the type safe version, the PFL version, something like that? Well, there's not really one EPFL version, and there's there's uh, no plan, as far as I am aware of, uh, to create one. And I think it doesn't make uh, sense. EPFL doesn't want to create a Scala distribution. EPFL has different projects, uh, which uh, may be forks of Scala, like Macro Paradise and Scala Virtualized. So you'll see uh, these different features tried out in their individual versions, and there will be one, one mainline Scala version by TypeSafe, where the features might eventually show up. So maybe like compiler plugins or like uh, as far as I understand like a lot of features uh, oh, yeah. sorry. Uh, as far as I understand a lot of features they are like wanted by some part of community but uh, they are like questioned if they are needed actually in Scala. So maybe like compiler plugins where like people who want to use this specific feature can like use it and uh, not pollute the actual Scala. So every time I think uh, I hear about compiler plugin, I actually think about macros. And well, y y you know. <laughs> when you hear about coffee, you think about macros. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The PhD information. So uh, I, I think macros are quite a step uh, forward in this direction. Uh, well, take a look at, say, a sync or a pickling. This is, this is things that uh, one would imagine require being hard-coded into the compiler. But actually, with macros, we've managed to, to move them into libraries. And therefore, people who want to do some cool stuff, uh, that uh, folks at TypeSafe who keep the trunk, such as Adrian, Martin, OK, uh, which folks at, at TypeSafe are not uh, uh, very sure of, well, people can go ahead and write their macros or compiler plugins. And, and, and then uh, th th this is a really easy uh, platform for experimenting. And then after it works out, after, after you just refer, after in SBT you just uh, refer to some compiler plugin, or, it, or with macros it's even easier, you just refer to a library as usual. So after experiment is deemed to be a success, then we can easily incorporate it into Scala. So I think, yeah. Okay, so um, question-wise, that's all pretty much all the time we have uh, for this evening. Does anyone have like any closing words or anything to add? Uh, yeah, <laughs> I would like to thank uh, Stefan and Eugene for making the way over here and 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 be with us. And I will of course also like to. And once again, I would like to thank uh, all of the speakers that we had here, all the amazing speakers, and to thank uh, Life Person Weeks, Yahoo, and Campus Tel Aviv for supporting us. Um, and last but not least, I would like to thank all of you guys for showing up and, and being here and wanting to support the Scala community. And you, sh you should really give yourself a big um, applause. You know. Okay, so I believe we're done for uh, we're done for the day. We're done for this event for this year. Um, as we mentioned at the opening ceremony, we don't want this to be a one-time thing. So uh, we're hoping to see all of you sometime next year for Scalpino 2014, and in between, we're hoping to see all of you, um, you know, in, in the various meetups uh, for underscore the user group or. Pretty much, you know, any any of the other development communities in Israel. So thanks for coming and have a great evening. Cheers. Thank you.